My name is Tom Stevens, and Stevens is spelled S-T-E-V-E-N-S. -E -E uh, date of birth was February 23, 1933. Mm -hmm. I was born in New York City. New York City. Yes, Manhattan. <coughs> Although we weren't living there at the time, my grandmother worked there at a hotel. She was the head uh, housekeeping person. And my mother and father lived in uh, Minnesota. For some reason, my mother felt that I should be born in New York City. And I can't give you the rationale for that. Other that all I can give you are the facts. My older sister told me this. My grandmother had retired from her job in New York City and came to live with us. So it was my mother, grandmother, and myself. My older sister would have nothing to do with the farm, so she went into nurse's training and left. And um, my mother was depending on me to assume responsibility for the farm, although at that time I was rather young, I was still in grade school. Uh, I, I was all for that idea. I really thought that was, would be wonderful. We moved from a farm in Wisconsin to a farm in Missouri, near Springfield, Missouri. Uh, the small town it was close to was Ozark, Missouri. And um, I was kind of athletic uh, as a kid and uh, got interested in basketball and uh, kind of uh, gave that the highest priority above farm, uh, above academics and everything else. And we were quite successful as a team. We won the Missouri State Championship. Small high school. When was that? That was 1951. Uh, I enlisted, of course, I was an enlisted man, and uh, went to basic training. Um, I remember leaving Springfield, uh, getting on a train. First of all, from the enlistment office, they said, well, you've got to go home, and uh, we can't take you for two weeks. Me and I went back to the farm, and that was the longest two weeks, I think, in my life. I couldn't have, you know, I just wanted to get going. Anyhow, the how, day came. How did your mom react to that? Oh, she was devastated. She was devastated. You were a bad boy then. I was a bad boy, that's right. I left her with that farm and no way to run it, really. I was really, yeah, that wasn't too good. <laughs> and after that, my, my mother and I had, were off again and off on again as far as, and she didn't like the woman I married, and that, that even made it worse. Although she came around finally Good. on that, yes. Um, anyhow, uh, I got in the train at Springfield, Missouri and took it to Kansas City, Missouri, which isn't all that far, but uh, took my physical examination in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. And I can't, the building where that physical was given is now expensive condos. But when I was there, it was a long room. And all these guys were lined up shoulder to shoulder. I would say 100 guys, you know, from one end of the room to the other. <laughs> I remember this doctor behind us saying, OK, now, bend over and drop your shorts. <laughs> And he came along and gave us all a prostate examination as he, <laughs> I don't know if he had gloves on and changed them between each other uh, or not. We took off. This was July of 1951. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but there was a huge flood in Kansas City in uh, 51, summer of 51. And the stockyards and all that were flooded. 
and as we and the airport, the downtown airport is adjacent to the stockyards. And we took off and we we're climbing out of Kansas City and I remember looking out at the window and looking down at the stockyards and there were cattle floating around in the water, dead. And um, anyhow, I was didn't smoke, but I saw all these guys lighting up after we got airborne. So that, to me, seemed like the thing to do. <laughs> so I, I lit up a cigarette, and of course it made me sick. But, so I was flying, and I smoked a cigarette, and it made me sick, so it wasn't a, a pleasant experience flying down there. Anyhow, we landed at Kelly Air Force Base, and well, it's San Antonio, Texas, and then uh, they put us on a um, shuttle bus, painted blue, Air Force blue, of course, and shuttled us over to Lackland Air Force Base. Now, this is July. San Antonio, Texas is hotter than blue blazes, and uh, we... At that time, they were taking a lot of people into the military, and they did not have barracks for everybody that they were taking in at the time. So we were put in tents, uh, not individual tents, it was a huge tent where just one cot after another were lined up. And I remember laying down, lying down on that cot, being given a GI blanket. I was still in civilian clothes, and as I recall, we slept in our civilian clothes that first night. And the next morning, at some ungodly hour, I heard this very threatening sounding voice yelling at us to get up. And I was kind of groggy, and before I even had a chance to get out of that cot, some big sergeant had taken the cot and tipped up one side of it, and I was on the ground. So, you know, that was sort of my introduction to military life. Welcome to the war. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, then we were marched uh, over to some location where we were issued various items of clothing, military clothing. And uh, uh, I, I remember when we got into a barracks location, um, our drill sergeant, we were divided up into flights, they called them in the Air Force. And in each flight, consisted of about 75 men. And uh, the way you marched, uh, you, the entire flight marched together and they lined you up th from the tallest to the shortest. And at 6'1", at that time, I was one of the tallest. So I was up at the head of one of the lines. So you were met four breast, and then you had what they called a right guard. That's generally a shorter gen uh, fella in front and he was um, someone who, uh, I guess, a drill sergeant had confidence in, who could uh, follow directions well. And at any rate, uh, that was the person that the four people in front lined up on, and whatever he did, you did. If he marched off a cliff, he went right off the cliff behind him. At any rate, we were taught how to march, start off with our left foot, how to do a right face, a left face, about face, oblique march right, and so forth. Anyhow, all that stuff. The drill sergeant said, okay, gentlemen, tonight we're going to have a party. I thought, man, that is really nice. The Air Force is going to have a party for us. How wonderful. Well, he said, a GI party. Excuse me, GI party. I didn't know what a GI party was. But I found out that evening, we were down on our hands and knees with, with brushes and soap and water scrubbing the floor of the barracks. <laughs> that was the party. Yeah. <laughs> and then, he, uh, and then I, I recall him uh, instructing us on how to make a bed and how to put a hospital corner on a bed. And uh, to this day, I still put a hospital corner on, on the bed at home. I, it's just a ha I don't feel right unless I do that. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I was only in Air Force four years. Anyhow, there are some things you pick up, and it just leaves an indelible impression on you, and it, it affects the way you think the rest of your life. At any rate, uh, during basic training, they give you a bunch of tests, shots and tests, and uh, they don't tell you how you do on the tests, 
And to tell you the truth, I really don't think the results of the test meant a whole lot because they put you where the, where the military or the Air Force needs you the most. And at that time, they were taking uh, B-29, which is a four-engine, propeller-driven aircraft, bomber, out of mothballs. They were, of course, the World War II long-range bomber uh, aircraft, the one that dropped the Enola, uh, the Enola Gay that dropped the atomic bomb on Japan, so forth. At any rate, they were put it in mothballs, made obsolete, but then when the Korean War came out, the, um, they took them out of mothballs, and um, the 307th bomb wing, which was at uh, MacDill Air Force Base, Orlando, Florida, they transferred the 307th to Okinawa, and uh, that was at the beginning of the Korean War. I was assigned out of basic training to Lowry Air Force Base, Denver, Colorado, and started into a turret system mechanic school. And the first two-week course that we were given was ACDC electricity. And then uh, troubleshooting uh, electrical systems. And I was taking all this stuff in and I'm thinking, how am I ever going to use this? Well, that was, uh, as I recall, three or four month training. They had three shifts of training. Uh, they had one shift going from 6 a.m. to 12 noon, 12 noon to 6 p.m., 6 p.m. to midnight. I happened to be on the uh, morning, 6 a.m. to noon. Lowry Air Force Base had two sections to it. They had names that I can't remember. At any rate, in the center was the active runway. We had to get up, get our breakfast, shave, what have you, fall into formation approximately 5 a.m. and march in mass all the airmen who were being trained on that first shift up to the runway, up to the active runway. And there was one gentleman in the front of the, oh, six or 700 of us who was in radio contact with the tower. And when the tower gave us the green light, we would march across the active runway. And then we would be in our classrooms until noon and then do that same thing in reverse. Uh, after the turret system mechanic school was completed, I started aerial gunnery school. Aerial what? Aerial gunnery. And we were introduced to the 50 caliber machine gun, and we learned each part of it, what its purpose was, how to take a 50 caliber machine gun, break it down into the smallest pieces, and put it back together. We didn't have to do that blindfolded, as the story goes. But uh, the electrical training prior to that was to acquaint us with, with the turret system of the B-29. Yeah. It was pretty sophisticated for that day and age. Uh, it was remote control gunnery, where if you had, let's say you were the right gunner on a B-29, you had a sight that was right in front of a blister, they called it, yeah. on the side of the aircraft, and you look through the sight, and you had a real stat thing, and it would adjust uh, some red circles that would get smaller or larger depending, and you were supposed to encircle your target within the, the circle of dots, and as the target got closer, of course, you would enlarge the circle by turning the real stat on the sight. And the site was on a pedestal, and it would go azimuth or up and down. There was an action switch 
on the site that you closed when you grabbed a hold of the site. Now, if you were shot or injured, you would release that and you would no longer have control of that turret. When you released the action switch, that left the turret free for another gunner to take control of it so that an enemy aircraft would never see a turret that was unmanned. It would always be turning and firing. Um, we flew training missions on, on B-29s out of Lowry. We would fly it to some location up in South Dakota, I believe it was, and we would fire at targets on the ground. So we'd be low enough that we did not have aerial targets. How was it? Was it kind of fearful or what was it? Excited? It was uh, excited and as a student, there was an instructor always standing right behind you. And um, beside gunnery training, we were the Eyes, eyes and ears of the pilot behind the wings. And we were supposed to not only be, when we weren't firing the guns, we were supposed to be scanning the sky for any other aircraft that might be in the vicinity and advising the pilot. You have an aircraft at three o'clock or whatever. And um, it was exciting. It wasn't scary for me. Now, uh, if I were to do that today, I'd probably be scared to death. But as an as a 18, 19 year old kid, it was just excitement. And uh, I do recall that one, one uh, B-29 loaded with trainees like myself uh, on landing at the Lowry Air Force Base plowed into a bunch of homes in suburban Denver and killed a, everyone on board the aircraft as well as a lot, a lot of people on the ground. That, and I, I remember driving out there to the crash site and looking, it was still smoldering. And for some reason, I wasn't in my mind able to say, gosh, that could have been me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, didn't, I, I, it must have occurred to me, but it, it, I thought it couldn't happen to me. So anyhow. You, we are still in 1951? Yeah, okay. yeah, still 1951. Okay. See, I got out of basic training. I went to basic training. That's eight weeks. Yeah, yeah. And so it's in the fall of 51. I left. Denver, I graduated from gunnery training, and I can't tell you the exact month I left Lowry, but at that time I was transferred to Randolph Air Force Base near San Antonio, Texas. And uh, I was assigned to a crew, a, a B-29 crew, and the different disciplines, navigation, bombardier, radar operator, radio, pilot, co-pilot, etc. These people, some of which had been recalled, so they didn't require a whole lot of retraining, but they came from their different locations from having graduated from their respective schools, and they congregated at Randolph Air Force Base, and uh, B-29 crews were being formed there. As I recall, the crew I was assigned to, I was the last person to be assigned to that crew and therefore the least desirable position on the aircraft was the only one still not filled. So I got assigned to be the tail gunner. I don't know if you've ever been in the tail of a B-29, no. but there is a rear entrance door, but that's about midway uh, from the from the uh, rear end of the uh, edge of the wing to the tail. It's about halfway up the fuselage. If you're going to the tail, as soon as you get into that door, you go left, and you go around the lower aft turret, and then you're you're down kind of crouching like this, and as you go further back, then you uh, eventually get down on your hands and knees, mm -hmm. and there's a door, and you go through the door, and there's a, a seat that's on a track, and you bring the seat down, then you get yourself turned around and sit down, and there you are, you're seated, facing to the rear, windows on each side and in front of you. 
you have a sight, a gunnery sight, mounted on the ledge, and there you got it. The only problem with all that is, if you're in the air and you get hit and the airplane goes down, there is no way in hell you're going to get out of that tail. You just go down with it. We were transported to Okinawa via MATS. Are you familiar with M-A-T-S? Well, that stands for Military Air Transport Service. And uh, for some reason, our crew, there are 11 men on a B-29 crew, got separated. So five or six of us made it to Hawaii, Honolulu, and the rest of the crew hadn't shown up yet. My crew, uh, and I, we were assigned to the 307th bomb wing. There, are, there were two bomb wings on the island of Okinawa, the 19th and the 307th. As I said earlier, the 307th had been transferred there from MacDill Air Force Base, Orlando, Florida. So our crew was what they called a replacement crew. We were not one of the originals that came from MacDill. Um, and of course, the crews that had transferred from MacDill were anxious to see the, the replacement crews show up because then they were able to go back to the States. Just before we had arrived on Okinawa, there had been a great loss of B-29s over North Korea. It was called Black Tuesday, I think. Uh, five, if I recall, five or six B-29s were shot down. Five? At least five. And the culprit was the new jet aircraft, Russian aircraft, the MiG-15. And the MiG-15 against a B-29 was like David and Goliath. I mean, there, it, it was no, con no contest. And a jet, and a jet fighter. Yep. Well, these jet fighters, and I knew this from training, they can get so far out from you that they just look like a little spot, if you can even see the spot. Yep. And if, this, if you're looking into the sun, you can't see them at all. And you're, you've been attacked before you even realize you've been attacked. At any rate, they lost a bunch of B-29s on that one particular mission. The commander of the um, SAC, which stands SAC, Strategic Air Command, General Curtis LeMay, who later, by the way, ran for Vice President of the United States with George McGovern. Oh. Now, is it clicking? At, at any rate, he hadn't reached that point in his life. But he was a five-star general, I believe. And his headquarters was Omaha, Nebraska. And as commander of SAC, Strategic Air Command, of which we were a part, he decreed that there will be no more daylight missions to Korea. So, I flew 27 combat missions as a tail gunner and a B-29, all of which were nighttime missions. We'd take off at 5 or 6 in the evening. We would be over Korea 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. We would, um, on the way up, it was interesting, being night missions, you cannot fly formation, which they had been flying during the day. On the way up, we would test fire our guns. Uh, we would fly through what they called a navigational fan. As a gunner, I'm not technically uh, informed enough to explain that to you in detail, but navigators we're basically giving the pilot a heading whereby coming out of the fan, all the B-29s flying to North Korea that night would be lined up single file, separated by about a minute's time. 
and that's the way you went over the target. Now, how do we know where the target was and when to drop the bombs since it was nighttime? On each side of the Korean Peninsula was a naval ship, and they were emitting an electronic arc. And somehow or another, they were able to put the intersection of that arc at the point at which the B-29s released their bombs, theoretically hitting the target. The gunners didn't go to the briefings. So I didn't know specifically what the target was. Now, if I was interested enough in, to ask an officer, what are we bombing tonight, he'd tell us. But from what I have read since getting out of the Air Force, the targets were supposedly stockpiles of ammunition, bridges, which from 26,000 feet, it's pretty hard to hit a bridge. How accurate back then did? Not very accurate. Right. We had a camera mounted with the lens pointed down in the rear of the aircraft, and it was light sensitive. And we carried 20 500-pound bombs in the forward bomb bay and 19 500-pound bombs, dumb bombs, in the aft bomb bay. And then we had something called a light bomb. That didn't mean it weighed less. It meant that when it exploded, it lit up the whole area just like those lights are lighting up me. Yeah. And that triggered the camera. And it would snap, I don't know how many pictures. And those pictures then would be, the film would be taken when we landed and evaluated as to how close we came to the target. Uh, we did fly uh, way far north. I mean, at one time, we, in turning around, as soon as we dropped the bombs, we, we turned, we did a U-turn and, and lost altitude as rapidly as possible because the guns on the ground uh, by that time had zeroed in on our altitude. And uh, so we took what they called evasive action. And um, what was I going to say? We turned around and... Uh, even closer to China? Oh, that, that's what I was going to say. The... We, would dri we drifted across the Yalu. Yeah, we were in Manchuria. And uh, the navigator uh, would call upon and say, uh, you're in Manchuria, you're not supposed to be here. He said, I know, we'll, we'll be out of here in just a minute. You know, so yeah, we crossed the Yalu. Well, that would have been April of 53. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, at that time, the Cold War was pretty hot. A hot Cold War. We didn't know if Russia was going to attack us or not. The B-50 was the best they had at that time, long-range bomber. The B-50 was sort of an updated B-29, larger engines, and could be air refueled. B-29s could not be. Many times on those missions to North Korea, we used so much fuel that we couldn't make it back to Okinawa. So we had to divert to Itazuki, Japan, to, and refuel, which was always a treat for us because at Itazuki, we could go to the chow hall and get fresh eggs. All the eggs we got on Okinawa had come out of a cave, been stored from World War II. So anyhow, uh, B-50s, air refueling, we were trained on how to load the atomic bomb. Jack the front end of the aircraft up, roll this huge monster of a bomb underneath it, lower the aircraft over the bomb, and then with pulleys, hoist it into the bomb bay. Take off. Actually, I have more flying hours in a B-50 than I do in a B-29, all over the United States. With the with the bomb, it was dummy. Okay. wasn't a live atomic bomb, but I don't think. Um, and take air refueling for practice. Uh, be attacked by fighters for practice. Gunners got their practice. And uh, did that. And we were, if the need arose, 
we were to take an atomic bomb to Russia and drop it. However, that was a short window for the B-50 because then the B-47 arrived on the scene. So uh, I was no longer needed and I had put in three years and, and six or seven months as at, at that time and at Walker Air Force Base, Roswell, New Mexico. How'd I get there? Well, from Biggs, they reassigned a bunch of people to Roswell. Why, I don't know. Again, they don't tell you why. They just say, go, get your bags and go. And I was flying B-50s, flying on B-50s out of Roswell then at that time. And they called me in and said, well, are you going to re-enlist? And I said, no, I don't believe so. And they said, well, uh, you only got three months left on your enlistment. And uh, the Air Force doesn't want to invest more money in retraining you. So we're going to let you go home. So I cleared the base, got in my car, and drove home. That was the end of my military life. When was that? That was in uh, April of, of 1955. I graduated in 1959 with an A.B. in economics and, psych and slash psychology. And then I started interviewing different companies for a job. And uh, I accepted a position with uh, Southwestern Bell Telephone Company in their management training program. And I spent the next 33 years there. Somewhat fortunate and also um, a little bit envious of the guys who are on the ground. I, I would, we would fly over Korea and I'd see the um, mortars going oh, back from the, air? from the air, going back and forth. I could see a lot of the firing going on. And I was thinking to myself, oh, especially during the night. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking to myself, I am really glad I'm not down there. Still, when in this stage of life, when I'm interacting with a lot of Korean War veterans who were on the ground, I have the utmost respect and admiration for them. Even though technically I am a Korean War veteran, mm -hmm. those guys, I feel, are probably more of a Korean War veteran than I am because they were down there, you know. However, if I was shot down, over North Korea. Uh, the North Koreans uh, didn't take to flyers very well. They didn't like bombs being dropped on their head and without being able to do much about it other than shoot at us at 26,000 feet in the air. And what do you think is the most important issues for the Korean War Veteran Association? Well, I'm uh, a member of the Board of Directors and uh, I'm the membership chairman. And of course, with our new president, Jim Ferris, he has placed a uh, new renewed emphasis on recruiting. And recruiting is probably right now uh, the most important thing because I can see that this organization um, is going to come to an end unless it recruits uh, people who have served in Korea since the war. So to prevent the death of the organization, I think the most important priority should be to get younger people into it. You know, but we don't have a, a uh, revolutionary war association. We don't have a civil war association. We don't have a World War I association. So uh, I don't, I don't know how long the Korean War uh, Association will continue. I, I hope that it goes on forever, but I don't think our kids or our grandkids are going to pick up the ball and run with it. I really don't. They want to hear what our experiences have been, and uh, I think it. Uh, it stirs them, it, it makes them feel uh, a part of that, but uh, I don't think they actually want to carry on the legacy, if you will. 
They have other priorities. And to tell you the truth, when I got out of the Air Force, went to college, I didn't even like to be called a veteran. Uh, I wanted to be considered one of them. I didn't want to be different. I wanted to be a student, a college student. And then when I went to work, I was in management and my orientation was doing the best job I could as manager at the telephone company. I had four small children and a wife. And my priorities were with the kids and with my job. It wasn't with the Korean War Veterans Association. It's only after I retired, and I think that's true of most of us. Uh, I have two, two granddaughters that are seniors in college, one at Trinity University of San Antonio and one at Baylor, Waco. And then I have a grandson who is a sophomore in college. And uh, the rest of them are, no, I ha and then I have another grandson who is in a junior college at Hutchinson, Kansas. So they're all in college? No, and then, uh, at, let's see, that's one, two, three, four. Three are in high school. High school? Yes. Do, do they, any of them live close to you? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. You can work with them. Have you talked to them about your career and your service during the war? Not really, right? In snippets. I got a call from a guy, a master sergeant in the Air Force at Barksdale Air Force Base. This had been a couple of years ago. And he said, were you in the 307th? And I said, yes. He said, well, the 307th is being reactivated at Barksdale Air Force Base, B-52s. He said, do you have any pictures? I said, yes. He said, would you mind if I came to your house and scanned them? And he showed up at my front door, and he had his laptop and his scanner, and I got my photo album down, and he scanned them all. And <clears throat> then he invited me and other 307th people. Uh, I happened to be the president of the 307th. And uh, he invited us to a reactivation ceremony at Barksdale Air Force Base, Shreveport, Louisiana, which was a very impressive ceremony where they unfold a flag, they retire a flag, and they unfold one, et cetera. And there are generals there speaking. And there was a banquet, and there was a, one of our own 307th guys, uh, a pilot by the name of Jerry Worthy, gave the talk at the banquet. And he had recorded, uh, he had written down every detail about every mission that he flew. And uh, so for the talk at the banquet, he, he went over three of the missions. And it was great. He did a great job. At any rate, the 307th is back in business in the Air Force. There was a 307th at Lincoln, Nebraska, and that was the B-47s. And uh, <clears throat> they were the Cold War uh, people that would deliver the atomic bomb after the B-50s were retired. And uh, the newsletter editor for that 307th, Lincoln, Nebraska, B-47s and KC-97s and myself, and now the 307th that's active in the Air Force, um, we're going to have a reunion in 2014 of all three editions of the 307th. So that would be great. 